for yourself, Professor. That's good. Yeah, I'm good too. Okay, so we'll get started. So we're on the last lecture now, so it's, I don't know, to me it seems like this semester has gone by really fast, so kind of insane we're on the very last lecture. So we're going to be doing, uh, obviously, this lecture today, and then we're going to have Thanksgiving break or, you know, fall recess, whatever you want to call it, and um, so that's next week, and then once we come back from that, then we're going to do the very last lab. Let me go to the syllabus here. Alright, so again, today we got the, the lecture. So I didn't update this on the syllabus, but you know, it says Memo 5 is due today. That's not true. I'm sure everyone's seen the email by now that Memo 5 is due on, I think it's the 29th of November. So take a look at that. You know, that's on Canvas for that due date. So, so again, don't freak out that the syllabus says this i just didn't change the syllabus okay so yeah you you guys have a long time or you have a lot of time to work on memo five uh because i'm having you do that data that data reduction on your own so um again you know i sent an email out about this but if you haven't read it you know hopefully you have but if you haven't you're doing that data reduction by yourself but i have given you some hints as for how to go about it if you're kind of lost. So I want you to work on it by yourself. I would really recommend you do that um, first. Um, you know, cause I don't want to box you in for, for how to go about the data reduction. So, um, but if you are lost for what to do, you can obviously ask me for help, but first you really do need to put in an effort by yourself. Um, but if you're lost, you can, a you can ask me for help. But again, the deliverables at the very end, I gave a little kind of like recommended guide for the data reduction. So what I did is I used a nested for loop. So I have a for loop and then within that for loop, I have another for loop. So basically the outer for loop is looping through those two different data sheets that we have. And then the for loop that's within that for loop, it's looping through all of the three different materials. So that's what I did personally. You don't have to use that same method. You can go about it in a different way and you can still get the same result. Uh, but yeah, that's what I did. <clears throat> and what you need to do in the end, there might be some other kind of add-ons for MATLAB to find intersection points, but um, we've used this function before, poly X, poly Y, in the very first lab to find an intersection point. Uh, so that's what I did in this lab. and. Basically, you are going to find this intersection point for this um, for the uh, transition or the energy where we transition from either going from ductile to brittle or brittle to ductile. And the actual curve that we are plotting in the lab, which is the um, impact energy versus temperature. So, you know, we have our curves here and you're going to be plotting the transition temperature, or sorry, the transition uh, impact energy. So imagine that there's like a line here, right? And uh, if we're looking at this blue curve, you would look at that intersection point and then that would be your ductile to brittle transition temperature. Anyways, all of that is in here. So, you know, take a look at that uh, if you're confused on kind of what to do. And uh, basically, you know, you guys always put your code at the very end of the report, and I'm going to be looking at that to make sure that I see that you actually do have code for uh, calculating this ductile to brittle transition temperature. And, uh, you know, even though your code, it might be for all three materials, um, just because it's easier to kind of write your code that way, you should, in your report, you should only have a transition temperature for both of the two different steels. So if we're looking at the graph here, you should only have in, in the memo a DBTT for 1018 steel and 4140 steel. If you look at aluminum here, it doesn't have a transition temperature. So I shouldn't see that in the report. It should just be for the two different steels. Um, I think this data set, this is for my 
Friday class at 8.30, so your graph won't look exactly like this, but it should look kind of similar. All right, so that's uh, lab five. And um, so we're going to be, um, or you're going to be working on that. That's due on the 29th. I think that's a Monday. Uh, so work on that. Really, you know, don't do that on the very last day. You know, the day of, don't start working on it then because you're kind of screwing yourself over. Um, you know, I know people do that uh, for a lot of their reports. Don't do it on lap five. It's not going to be good. Okay, so again, lecture today. Then we have full recess. We come back. We do the very last lab in person. And then the week after that, we're going to have a kind of uh, a review for the final um, you know, that's going to be a pretty fast class. I, I'll kind of go over what the final is going to be like, what's going to be on there, uh, how we're going to take it. It's going to be online, by the way, and I'll give you a full day, most likely. Uh, so we'll talk about all of that then, though. And, um, and then the week after that is the final exam. So, um, again, we'll talk about all of that, uh, on December 9th. Okay, so that's the plan from here on out. Dang, I didn't want to close that. Okay. So, lap six, double shear. I didn't upload the procedures quite yet to Canvas. I'll do that, though. Um, but this is what it's going to look like, all right? So, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the actual theory for shear stress and all of that. that I mean, this has got to be... A throwback now for everyone. I think you talked about shear stress in the basically the very beginning of your solid mechanics class. Uh, but that's going to be the very last lab that we have. It's uh, going to be shear stress for us, double shear. So we're going to have uh, shear fracture at two different kind of uh, surfaces. So this is what the test setup looks like. We're using the MTS machine again. The fixtures are a little bit different this time for what we have. So we have three different materials here. We have a uh, 1018 steel. It's going to be color coded on the very end of the rod, just like some of the other laps that we've, you know, had um, almost all of them. And then we have um, copper. So over here is copper right here. I think it's C40 if I'm correct. Um, that's off the top of my head. And then we have um, aluminum 6061T6 like we have. Um, a lot of the time. Alright, so we're going to be recording the diameters like we do very often in three different spots. Take the average. And then another kind of uh, column here for data is going to be... Um, sorry, I'm pulling up the chat just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, and so the last thing is the length after the test. So we're going to be measuring the the length of the rod for um, kind of the portion that was experiencing, not really experiencing shear. I'll show you, I'll show a picture and you'll get a better idea. It's going to be, we're going to be measuring the length after the test that's going to be in between these um, two different surfaces here. Okay, so here are your little test pieces. So these two uh, discs here, they're going to go in between these two holes here and then the centerpiece obviously is going to be in the center and you're going to be sliding a rod through um, this hole here and uh, that's going to be the test setup so you can see a better picture here for how it's set up and then we're going to put the rod in between here okay here's a better picture showing the rod actually uh, in the hole there Right, and you, you're going to apply a preload um, just like, what was that? It was for, for the column. You remember for the column lab, we used the hand controller with the, the thumb wheel there. And we were very careful for applying the preload. You're going to do that same kind of thing for this lab. All right, and then this is going to be the graph that we get in the end. So it's going to be the load versus the crosshead position. So the crosshead position, I've had a few people ask me before 
what that means. It's the position for this kind of top jaw here. So it's going to be recording that position from the very beginning of the test to the end. And we're going to be plotting that force versus the crosshead position. So we're going to see that the force is going to increase, of course. It's almost like a, a stress strain diagram um, in the sense that, you know, the force is going to increase and eventually it's going to start dropping off. And then it's going to fail at one point, which is going to be over here. Or I guess I should say really right here. And, um, and then that's when we have shear failure. Okay, so load is increasing, it's going to drop off, it's going to fail. And then we have the uh, two different shear fracture surfaces. So you're, you're going to see this for all three materials, and we're going to plot them all in the same graph, and we'll see how they kind of differ. Okay, export the raw data. And um, then we're going to remove the sample. So you see here, it's going to break and kind of obviously on two different planes here because we're in double shear. So we have one piece that falls down over here, and this one kind of got stuck in this example. But in the middle here, there's actually, you know, still material in here, actually more like right here. Um, and we're going to be taking that out, and you're going to measure that length. So that's going to be the length that we measure in the end. Okay, then you're going to take, that's it right there, so it's pretty small. Then you're going to take a picture of the fracture surface that we have. So depending on the material, you're going to see that it's, it's going to look different. So this looks like it's copper. And uh, so we're going to take pictures of that with the camera that you just saw, just like we did in, in lab five. And um, so for more ductile materials, they're going to, the term we use pretty often is smear. So it's going to, it looks like, like for copper, I don't know, almost like peanut butter, it smears quite a lot. So that's because it's very ductile. So you're going to see it, again, just smearing a lot. You're going to see this kind of uh, look here. And the uh, more brittle materials, they're, they're not going to look like they smear quite as much. Okay. And that's it. So yeah, you're going to be measuring the length and you're, you're going to be doing this test twice for each material. And then we're going to have basically in the end two graphs, just like we had for the Chirpy impact test. We're going to have two graphs because we're doing this test twice for each material. And we're also going to calculate the bearing stress as well. So I didn't say that uh, or it's not in the procedure here, but we'll we'll talk about that too. So we're going to calculate the shear stress and the bearing stress for this lab. Okay. So that's a, a little preview for what it's going to look like. So, um, oh yeah. So before we get started on the lecture, your lab three grades. I'm almost done with them. I know it's that you know that's taken a while too. So, um. I think this semester it's taking a lot longer for me to get all the grades in because I have usually I just have two sections for this class or one or two. This semester I have three and I like getting all of the grades out for each section at the same time. Um, it's just easier that way. But for you guys, I just need to grade the abstract still. So they're almost done. Obviously, it's going to be I'll be done grading them far in advance before your your fifth memo is due which is on the 29th you know, someone already finished it so that's good um, so yeah and then i'll grade lab four as well as soon as i can okay anything else i think that's it for the announcements and i'll say one more time though really make sure you start working on the lab five memo in advance so I know no one wants to work on it during like uh, the break that we're going to have, but if you can at least get started on it, at least work on it a bit and see what, you know, what you can do. And if you start to struggle on it, well, you can work on that uh, a bit later on. So, um, you know, just really just do it before the, the very last day, because even when I already give you a data reduction video, there's still... You know, often questions because the data will kind of differ from what I have versus what you have sometimes. And so there's still questions then, which is fine. But if you're doing this data reduction all on yourself this time, 
there's probably going to be uh, more struggles for figuring out the code. So really get a, a head start on that. Okay, so um, any questions before we get started? Did not mean to open up MATLAB. There's no questions. We'll get started on the lecture. It's a pretty fast lecture, by the way. It's a pretty simple lab, um, which I guess, you know, for you guys, it's it's kind of nice in a way to finish off on something that's easier. Let's move this over. Okay, so I already wrote some stuff out just to, I don't know, get it out of the way. So again, we're doing a double shear uh, stress test for this lab. We have our three metal rods that we already talked about, aluminum, 6061T6. I meant to put the colors on here. So that's going to be green, copper, uh, that's going to be red, and then 1018 steel, that's, that's going to be blue. Okay, we're going to subject all of these to double shear two times. So we're going to have one test and then we're going to do another test. And we're going to, in the end, uh, compare the experimental versus the theoretical shear strength. So the shear strength is going to be that maximum um, load that we can handle divided by the cross-sectional area that uh, we're subjecting the material to. And that's going to be the shear strength. So very basic uh, formula there. And the theoretical shear strength, uh, that it, it's pretty shit, really. It, the, um, the way that we model it, theoretically, is, yeah, it's pretty, pretty bad. It's pretty crude. So you'll see it's just a constant multiplied by the ultimate tensile strength for that material. So it's not a great uh, approximation, theoretically, but that's what we have. Okay, then we're going to calculate the bearing stress, which is, you know, the stress that's kind of shared between two surfaces or two objects. And then in the end, uh, what you're going to be doing in the memo um, for the graphs, you're plotting the shear stress or the shear strength versus the crosshead position. So you already saw that graph, what it's going to kind of look like. All right, so what is shear stress? So again, this should be a throwback to the beginning of your solid mechanics class. Uh, but uh, for a, a refresher, it's going to be the intensity of the internal force that we have. So um, whatever loading that we have, and um, that is acting on a surface, and that's going to be parallel to the uh, internal force. Okay, so maybe I should do it like this. So here we have, um, you know, one force here for the picture on the left. So this is uh, single shear. Okay, so this is going to be failing only on one surface here. So really, it's it's um, it's like this. So you'll see that it's it's acting just in this kind of one kind of cross-sectional area. Okay, that's the main thing. So one cross-sectional area here. Okay, right there, and that's where it's going to fail. And you see, you know, our force is going down, and the surface it's parallel to that force. So that's where we are going to fail. And in contrast to our first two labs, you know, those are in tension. The force that we had, that was acting perpendicular to our surface here. So that's kind of the difference, right? Uh, normal stress, the force is perpendicular to our cross-sectional area. Shear stress, the, the force is going to be parallel to that kind of cross-sectional area. Okay, and then for us, we are doing double shear, so we're going to have two different surfaces where we have our material fail. Oh, okay, yeah, for some reason I thought I, I drew a diagram for that too. I didn't quite yet. Okay. 
Okay, so let's talk about the, the equation for this, right? The equation for our shear strength. Okay, so that's, uh, we already talked about it, but it's going to be the force divided by the cross-sectional area that we have. Okay, so for shear strength, we're going to use tau, that's going to be the shear strength. And then V, that's going to be the shear force that we have. So I might say V, I might say F, I might say P. It's the same thing, it's just the, the force, really. And then A sub V, that's our cross-sectional area um, that's uh, subjected to the shear force. I also might say either shear stress or shear strength. Uh, again, same, I mean the same thing, at least in context for this lab. Okay, the, it's kind of a little laggy today, my app. Okay, V, that is the shear force. Wow, it's not even loading anymore. Let me disconnect this really quick. Let's see if it starts to work better. Okay, and then A sub V, that's the cross-sectional area, or I'll say the area of the resisting section. Okay, so for our lab, that's just going to be this cross-sectional area that you see um, in pink or in blue right there. So we're going to uh, get that cross-sectional area. So of course, just pi divided by 4 multiplied by the diameter squared. Okay, so this equation right here, this is for single shear, okay? Because we only have one cross-sectional area here. For our, our, um, our lab, we're doing double shear because we're going to have two different uh, surfaces where we are going to fail. So all we have to do is put a 2 in front of that cross-sectional area. But before we write that down, let's actually kind of show what uh, what this is going to look like. Um, yeah, okay. Let me pull it up in my OneDrive here. I have a, a good picture. Okay, here it is. Okay, so for us, we're doing double shear. So what we're gonna see in the end is this kind of um, picture here. So it's gonna fail, you know, on this surface here, and it's also gonna fail on a different surface over here. Okay, so that's, so that's what we're gonna see in our lab, and you know, this kind of centerpiece here, that's gonna be uh, you know, what we have for, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. This centerpiece here, that's going to be the length that we measure after the test, okay? So our test setup is going to look something like this. So you already saw the pictures in the very beginning of the lab, but we're going to have basically that, that centerpiece here, that's going to be pushing down on our rod here, and then we're going to fail on these two different surfaces. So the picture that I drew in the beginning uh, for a single shear, maybe not the quite the best picture there. Um, so let's draw a better picture for double shear now, which is going to be looking like this. So again, we're going to be failing on these two different surfaces here. And uh, because of that, we have these two different surfaces that's going to be uh, double shear. Okay. And again, it's going to look like this in the end. It's obviously, we have like a thinner rod relative to this, but it's going to fail in the same kind of way, where in the end we have, um, I guess it's going to have three pieces because we have these two surfaces that were subjected to a shear force. Okay, so let's draw that.
Yeah, sorry, sorry. I should have draw this. I should have drawn this picture a bit better. But anyways, we'll we'll draw it for double shear right now. Okay. So we're gonna have our rod here, and then basically we're gonna have this kind of. I'm drawing it like a square, but um, basically we have like some centerpiece that's gonna be pushing down on the rod. So we're gonna have a force here. I'll put a V there, that's our shear force. So that's going to be pushing down on the rod, and that's going to cause our rod to fail along two different surfaces. So one surface here, one surface here. And that's going to be, um, of course, double shear in the end. So we're going to have the first cross-sectional area and the second one. Of course, that cross-sectional area for each of them, it's, it's the same, but I'm still going to call it A sub 1 and A sub 2 because we're failing on both of those different surfaces. All right, so that's our double shear kind of test setup. And then again, for this modified formula now, all we have to do is put in a two in front of the cross-sectional area, because we have these two different surfaces. Alright, so there we go. Uh, pretty simple, right? And I guess we can rewrite this as V over 2 multiplied by pi over 4 d squared for the cross-sectional area. Okay, so for the lab, you know, the primary form of failure is going to be this uh, shear stress that we have. But if you kind of look at this setup here, you can, it looks similar to like the beam lab, right? We have, you know, for that lab, we have two different forces going down. Uh, but either, either way, we have a force going down here on a rod. So there's actually going to be some bending that's going on. So the, um, the rod is going to fail for mostly shear, but there is going to be some bending as well. And there's also going to be some um, stresses from from bearing so there's some bearing stress because we have these two different surfaces that are um, kind of in contact with each other so we have the rod itself and the kind of uh, casing that it's in so I should have kept this open so if we go back to our um, pictures here you can see that you know there's gonna be some bearing stress where this rod is in the center here and it's in contact with those those three different discs that we have so there's a disc here there's a disc here and then there's a disc in the center there so it's it's in contact um you know because it went through all of those different discs so there's some bearing stress in there um so we're going to calculate the bearing stress as well so not the bending stress for this lab, but we're going to calculate the, the shear stress and the bearing stress. Okay, and I'm going to show um, a little a picture uh, pretty soon here to get a better visualization for that bearing stress. Because I think it's always good, at least when I took solid mechanics, to, to really get a good visual on bearing stress. Because it's, I don't know, unless you draw it out, it's kind of hard to visualize, at least for me. Okay, and my computer or my iPad stopped sharing the screen again. It's usually better than this. Okay, there we go. So before we talk about that, we're going to have the equations, though, for the uh, theoretical shear strength. So remember, I said that the uh, formulas for this are kind of crap. Um, but anyways, let's get these down right now.
So kind of like the intermediate columns for, um, for the fourth lab, right? That theoretical formula was actually an empirical formula. So same kind of thing here. We have empirical formulas to get a pretty rough estimate for what the theoretical shear strength is going to be for different materials. So for copper, so I'm going to say tau max because that's going to be the maximum shear stress that we have. So the shear strength. That's going to be equal to 0 0.65 multiplied by the ultimate tensile strength. Then we have aluminum. And that's also going to be 0 0.65 multiplied by the ultimate tensile strength for aluminum. Uh, 60, 61, T6. Okay, and then our last one is going to be 1018 steel. And this one is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be 0 0.75 multiplied by the UTS. All right, so there are our formulas. Um, yeah, you know, not too exciting there. So just a constant multiplied by that UTS value. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the bearing stress. So I think bearing stress is also probably a throwback to the beginning of your solid mechanics class, at least it was for me when I took that class, it was in the very beginning, and that's pretty much the only time we talked about it. Okay, so bearing stress is the, the stress that we have for two different um, um, surfaces that share kind of a cross-sectional area. Okay, and uh, again, for us, for this lab, it's going to be the rod that we have and the, the kind of hole that it's, um, that it's in. I think of a better way to state this. So for the rod and the hole that it sits in. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a picture for this and um, a little mock-up that I made, I don't know, like two years ago or something now for uh, in SolidWorks for it to get a better like visual for what this looks like. But before we do that, we'll write down the formula for that. So. It's, it's stress, right? So it's going to be force over some area. It's going to be uh, the force over that area that's shared between our two different objects for the rod and the hole. And, that, and that's it, right? So we have sigma B, that's our bearing stress. We're going to have our force. And then we have our shared area. So I'll write this as A sub B, and I'll rewrite this now. Man, it dropped again. I don't know what's up with the connection today. Oh, there it is again. Okay. So that shared area, for us, it's going to be the, the length of the rod. I'm actually going to rewrite this right now as L sub M. So L sub M, this is going to be the length of the rod in the middle. Okay. And then we have the diameter of the rod itself. So 
So a length of rod in the middle. Um, so you'll get a better idea of what I mean by this too because it's still a little bit vague. Okay, but that's going to be our formula for the bearing stress. All right, now let's look at some pictures to get a better visual on this. Okay, so the, the length of the rod in the middle, what I mean there is this kind of section right here. So that's the part that's subjected to bearing stress. Okay, because we have the shared area between uh, the rod in the, in the middle here and the, the hole that it's sitting in right here. So, you know, we have this force coming down on the rod. So there's this um, stress that's being shared between these two different materials. So the, the rod and then that kind of disc that it's within. Uh, so this picture, it's not great. So I'll show you a better picture right here. So, um, so here we have the rod. And it's, uh, there's the shared area for these three different disks right now because, you know, there's one disk here, there's a disk here, and another disk here. Um, so all of that, it's being subject to this bearing stress because we're sharing that, um, that area with the rod here and then the, the three disks, okay? So we'll look at a cross-sectional view now because I think that's an even better way to visualize this. Right, here we go. So let me get one where it's not highlighted. Okay, so we have our our rod, and then we have our three different sections. So here is a disc, here is a disc, and here is a disc, and we have our force that's going down on the rod. And our bearing stress is between the rod and these three different discs that we have. So, you know, they're sharing an area here, and we said that that shared area was the length of the rod in the middle multiplied by the diameter. So the length of the rod in the middle is going to be this kind of length here. It's, um, it's that length where we're sharing area with these three disks, okay? So we'll get a cross-sectional view, and this is what it looks like. So it's from right here on this edge all the way to this edge here, okay? You see that we're sharing all of this area with the rod and the three different discs, okay? So you're gonna get that length. You're gonna measure that after the test finishes. And, um, and that's gonna be the length that you plug into for your bearing stress. Okay, so hopefully that's a better visualization um, for bearing stress. Again, we're going from this edge to this edge so it's that length multiplied by the diameter of our rod. All right, so that's that's actually it for this lecture. So it's not too much, right? Um, yeah, and then we already talked about the experiment for how that's going to kind of go. Uh, so we're going to be calculating that shear stress with our formula where it's uh, the shear force divided by 2 multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the rod. And we're also going to calculate the bearing stress. That's our force divided by the this length here, multiplied by the diameter. All right, and then we're going to make some plots, of course, too. Okay, so uh, any questions on this lecture, or I don't know any of the the past labs, like uh, lab five. Nope. Okay. So if there's no questions, and that's all I have for today. So remember that next week is Thanksgiving break or fall recess. And uh, after the break, we're going to come back and we're going to have lab six in person. Okay. And your fifth memo is due on the 29th of November. All right, so that's it for today. So if there's no questions, then I'll see you guys in, I guess, two weeks from now. Thank you, Professor. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Samson. I'll see you guys.
Manuel, you got any questions?